The whole Nat Tate idea was to write a piece of fiction that seemed so real that people wouldn't think it was fiction. So I, so I wrote a kind of mini biography of Nat Tate's sad life. Um, and I illustrated it with photographs, some of real people, like Picasso's in it and ver uh, various art critics are in it, but also photographs I found in, in junk shops and car boot sales. And so I was able to identify these anonymous people as Nat Tate's stepfather or Nat Tate's uh, dealer, um, Nat Tate's uh, girlfriend, that sort of thing, and create this little book which had all the um, appurtenances of a proper biography. It had acknowledgments, footnotes, captions under the photographs, and the idea was just send it out into the world and see what happened. It helped that my publisher was David Bowie, um, and he had a little publishing house called 21 Publishing. And he wrote the blurb to my book. I mean, how cool is that? Um, I think it's the only blurb that Bowie's ever written in, in his life. But anyway, we decided the aim was to launch the book out, say nothing, present it straight, and see what happened. And we decided to have our first launching party in New York in the studio of Jeff Koons, who was a friend of Bowie's, a huge studio. And, you know, if David Bowie invites you to a party, you know, you'd probably say yes. And so we had this incredible party in New York, all the kind of glitterati, art world, uh, rock and rollers, uh, actors, and, and so on. And Bowie read extracts from the book, Nat Tate. That's all, that's all he did. But in the little circle of conspirators, there was an English journalist, and he went around the party saying, have you ever heard of Nat Tate? What do you think of his work? And of course, people being people didn't tell the truth. They started to lie and say, yes, I remember going to a show of his and um, I think I've got one of his paintings and so on. And so the hoax was born. We were about to do the same thing the next week in London. Similar thing, big restaurant, all the young British artists were going to come along. But this journalist who'd got the story uh, felt it was too hot, he couldn't sit on it anymore. So he, he blew the hoax wide open about four or five days after the first party. And it was front page on the independent newspaper, English novelist fools Manhattan art world. Well, did I, how many people did I fool? Um, I was trying to make people believe it was true and evidently I'd succeeded. But the whole thing got completely out of hand. And initially I was quite angry because I was wanting this sort of slow burn of weeks and months to go by and people thinking, is it real, is it fake? But it, suddenly it became a huge hoax and I became the hoaxer. And it was a 24-hour news event. I was on American TV, I was being interviewed by Japanese magazines and uh, profiles in foreign newspapers. And it's never gone away. Um, it's, that was in 1998. Uh, we had the party on April Fool's Day, 1998. And here we are, you know, 14, nearly 14 years later, and the Nat Tate phenomenon has never died. Um, we've made three television documentaries about him, and the last thing I did was to try to bring about closure. So I painted another Nat Tate uh, drawing, actually drew another Nat Tate, and we just last uh, uh, November, we sold it at auction in Sotheby's. Big sale, <clears throat> and we got 7,250 quid, which is pretty remarkable for a fictitious work of art by a fictitious artist. And I thought, well, that's it. You know, Nat lives, he sold a painting. Um, he can rest in peace, but unfortunately, I think it's going to rumble on forever and ever. And, when I'm dead and gone, I'll only be remembered for Nat Tate and everyone will have forgotten my novels.